Hi everyone and welcome to the primary source webinar, Perspectives on Nature and the Arts of Japan. My name is Josh Craycraft, I'm one of the program directors at Primary Source and I'll be facilitating this evening's discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to talk a little bit about the format for today's discussion and how you can participate. First of all, if you haven't done so already, please be sure to run the audio setup wizard, which you can find in the upper left hand corner of the screen. It's the little icon of the microphone and the red soundburst. In just a few moments, I'll be introducing our keynote speaker for the evening, Professor Yukio Lippet, uh, who we're very fortunate to have with us tonight. He'll be giving a talk that'll last about 45, 50 minutes or so, after which we'll have some time for Q&A. To participate and ask questions, simply type them in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please keep in mind that this chat box is public, and that even if you have, uh, or think you're having a private conversation with another participant, Professor Lippet and I will still be able to see what you type. As moderator, I'll be selecting questions for discussion that you type into the chat box. I expect that we will be able to get to everyone's questions tonight, um, but uh, we may discuss them out of order. Uh, and unless you have a burning question that, for the sake of clarity, for example, needs answering right away, I ask that you do please hold your questions until the Q&A portion at the end. Another thing I'd like to do before we get started is quickly explain who we are at Primary Source, since I know that some of you may be encountering us for the first time today. If so, welcome, and for those of you who are longtime friends, welcome back. As you can see here, we are a 27-year-old nonprofit organization started by teachers for teachers with the specific goal of bringing the wider world and all of its color and complexity to students. We do this by creating professional development programs for K-12 educators that are focused on U.S. and global content and themes. We run both face-to-face -face and online programs, for example, including grad-level courses, international study tours, and online seminars such as this one. We also produce multimedia resource guides and curricula about U.S. and global topics, two of which we'll be highlighting at the end of this session. Information about all of these resources and opportunities is accessible through our website at primarysource.org, and I encourage you to check them out. And finally, I want to take a moment uh, to thank the United States Japan Foundation for their generous financial support that, make, uh, that made this webinar possible. The foundation is committed to promoting stronger ties between Americans and Japanese by supporting projects like this one that foster mutual knowledge and education, deepen understanding, uh, create effective channels of communication, and address common concerns in an increasingly interdependent world. Uh, thanks so much for making opportunities like these possible. And now on to the topic of the evening, Japanese arts. We have three main goals tonight. First, we want to explore the Japanese arts by taking a closer look at the medium of wood. Second, we want to better understand the intersection of science and art by exploring the ways in which geography and ecology have informed artistic traditions in Japan. And finally, we'll be doing all this by taking close looks at Japanese architecture, sculpture, and woodblock prints. It's really exciting to be able to bring you content that is so interdisciplinary, uh, and we hope you leave tonight with some ideas on how you can bridge these subjects in your own classrooms. Uh, I've mentioned several times already, uh, we have speaking with us today Professor Yukio Lippet, an individual to whom I'm delighted to introduce you. Dr. Lippet holds a PhD in art and archaeology from Princeton, and he's now a professor of the history of art and architecture at Harvard, where incidentally he concentrated in literature as an undergrad. Suffice it to say, he's a man of many interests and talents. He teaches about Japanese architecture, urbanism, prints, and modern art, and he's especially interested in the intersection uh, between Zen Buddhism and Japanese painting and sculpture. He's also the director of undergraduate studies in the department and of the Radcliffe Institute's arts program. We're so honored uh, that he's with us tonight and that he is as excited as we are uh, to do a webinar on this topic for this particular audience of K-12 educators. Professor Lippet, thanks so much for joining us and please feel free to begin. Thank you very much, Josh. And let me just say that it's, um, it's a real delight to be able to participate in this webinar with all of you. Now, um, as its title suggests, the webinar examines the relationship between nature and Japanese art and culture. And generally speaking, the, uh, the arts of Japan are understood to have a vital relationship to nature and the seasons, uh, especially in terms of their subject matter and themes. Uh, if I were to choose a representative example in this regard, it would be the work that you see here, which is one of the most famous paintings in the history of Japan. It's a pair of uh, six panel folding screens by an artist named Ogata Koring. It's painted in the uh, early 18th century. 
And as you can see, it's a very decorative work. And its display would have been occasion specific. It would have been brought out probably uh, during the season that irises bloom. That would be around the fifth month of the lunar calendar in, uh, in Japan at the time. Now, although, as this work shows, Japanese art is closely associated with uh, themes of nature, this in and of itself is not unusual. And there is uh, perhaps no artistic tradition anywhere in the world that is not somehow deeply imbricated in the natural world, uh, that does not have a vital relationship to its environment, um, that does not somehow thematize, reflect, or internalize the processes of the natural world. So one might say that the singularity of any cultural tradition lies in how this relationship between art and nature is manifest. And in Japan, uh, one of the more particular ways in which one might think about the relationship between art and nature is in terms of the materiality of its artistic and cultural production. And more specifically, its abundant use of wood. How art in Japan emerges from and showcases the quality of wood and the qualities of wood. And by extension, the forests and the biomass heritage of the Japanese archipelago. So today, uh, I'd like to discuss the relationship between uh, of Japanese art to nature through its materiality, the relationship of Japanese art to wood. And as you know, uh, the Japanese archipelago, as you see in this map, is a, it's a largely consists, it's a, it's a chain of islands uh, centered around a crescent moon-shaped main island at the eastern edge of the Eurasian landmass on the other side of the Pacific Ocean from the west coast of the United States. And um, Japanese civilization develops on the main island uh, in the region which is marked uh, Nara, Kyoto, and Osaka, which is kind of to the left of the central elbow of the main island. Um, the Islands in Jap the Japanese islands are relatively poor in resources such as stone, ore, and most precious metals, but extremely rich in timber. And in particular, uh, the Japanese islands are characterized by an abundance of both conifers and deciduous trees, and typically uh, softwoods such as pine, cypress, and fir were used for architecture and uh, so-called hardwoods, such as oak and chestnut, um, were used for furniture and other kinds of woodwork. Now, the most valued sources of timber in Japan were cypress, uh, known as hinoki in Japanese, which um, had many appealing qualities, uh, straight grain. Um, it grew to um, a, a fairly uh, good height, around 40 meters. Uh, had an appealing color and aroma, and uh, hinoki cypress was ideal for precise cutting. So I'd like to uh, examine the question today of how wood relates to cultural production in Japan's history. And I'd like to approach this question by examining three representative areas, architecture, sculpture, and woodblock prints all areas in which Japanese artisans are widely um, thought to have uh, made unique contributions. So let's begin then with architecture and with a celebrated site, a site known as the Ise Shrines. This Ise Shrines are the holiest uh, site of Japan's Shinto religion, a place of worship of um, one of the most prominent deities of Shinto, the sun goddess Amaterasu. And for much of its history, um, Amaterasu was not only considered the most important deity in the Japanese archipelago, and I should add that there were many such deities, but also the ancestress of the imperial line, which meant that the imperial family actually traced its mythic origins to this deity and was one of the entities that for centuries oversaw its maintenance and well-being. Now, historically, the Ise shrines were the most popular uh, pilgrimage destination in Japan, 
and prayers uh, there were believed to bestow abundant harvests and other this-worldly benefits on worshippers. And the shrines have maintained their status as a popular pilgrimage destination, receiving upwards of 7 million visitors uh, per year. And most of these, uh, around half of these visitors um, visit the shrine actually during the first three days of the new year. And I'm, I'm, what I'm showing you here is a photograph of uh, a New Year's Day uh, visit by throngs of, of Japanese to the Issei shrines. Uh, it's a photo taken around 10 years ago. Now, Issei can be, uh, returning to our map of Japan, Issei can be located on this um, small uh, earlobe-shaped peninsula just west of center of the main island. Um, if you look at this small pendant peninsula, uh, you'll see the ancient capitals of Kyoto and Nara. And just to the southeast of the capital of Nara, you see Issei. Um, this region of Issei is about 100 kilometers removed from uh, the basin where the imperial clan established its power base and ancient capitals during the 7th century of the Common Era. And it's also reasonably close on the other side to Issei Bay uh, to the east, which is a major entrepot for trade throughout the islands and throughout East Asia. But the shrines uh, also, as you can see from this aerial view on the left, were couched, are couched within a somewhat mountainous region uh, in a heavily forested area so that the bay and other urban centers seem remote. Indeed, when one visits Issei, one has the sensation of visiting really a primeval forest filled with ancient, venerable uh, cypress and cedar trees. Now, let me begin my uh, discussion of the Issei shrines by introducing the most famous fact about the shrines, what has been perhaps the single most important source of the admiration and surprise they've garnered over the years. And that is the fact of what is known as their renewal, the regular renewal of the Issei shrines every 20 years. <clears throat> now, the Issei shrines are rebuilt from the ground up every 20 years. Since the late 7th century, when the first uh, renewal took place, this has happened more or less continuously for well over a millennium. And this means that the Issei shrines have been rebuilt uh, to date a total of 62 times. The latest renewal took place in, in the fall of 2013. During the 1,200 plus year history of the shrines, this 20 year rebuilding cycle has been strictly maintained with only uh, two exceptions that we know of. The first due to uh, civil wars that ravaged the country during the late 15th and 16th centuries. And the second delay uh, was due to the turmoil of World War II and its aftermath, which caused a delay of four years in the rebuilding of the shrines after the war, simply because of the devastation uh, uh, of the war. Otherwise, the practice of dismantling the shrines and then reconstructing them with all new materials has been observed without fail every two decades. And this is since the first recorded renewal of uh, the year 690. Now, when I say rebuilt, I'm referring to everything. All 125 buildings in the total shrine complex, large and small structures, the gilt bronze fittings on the architecture, and all of the ancillary buildings, the treasuries, storehouses, the Uji Bridge, which you see in this photo on the bottom right, uh, which marks the main entrance to the shrine complex, the gates, everything gets renewed. Not only is the architecture rebuilt, but so are the shrine treasures that are stored therein. Even the tools that are used in the rebuilding are remade on every occasion. Now, the sheer dimension of this enterprise is staggering when you hear the numbers. Uh, the entire process takes eight years. Okay. Over the course of this eight-year span, there are 32 ceremonies that mark various stages, from the felling of the first tree to the transportation of timber by various communities throughout the main island, uh, to the purification of the, of the site, the raising of the first pillar, and also finally to what you see in this photo, which is the final transfer of the sacred regalia 
from the old architecture to the new, which takes place at midnight uh, on um, the evening before the first official day of the renewal. Much of the regalia itself has to be reproduced en masse. So among other things, this means that there are uh, 1,500 swords that are recast every 20 years. For the architecture, there are some 13,000 trees that are felled, about 25,000 bundles of cut reed are harvested, uh, 80 carpenter studios are mobilized, 10 of which are in permanent residence on the site. Um, the total cost of the last renewal was thought to have exceeded some $500 million, almost all of which was raised in donations of very small sums by private citizens. Now, um, the reasons for the renewal have to do with the importance of the concept of renewal and of purity, the, the purity that comes with it in Shinto religion. And the fact of this renewal uh, makes of Issei something of an architectural conundrum. It is an architecture that dates to the 7th century when its layout and design were conceived, when its institutional function was established, but at the same time the current buildings themselves are only three years old. Uh, there's, a, there's a wide disparity between Issei as an architecture, as a shrine institution, as a concept, and its current physical incarnation. So it's both very old and very new. Uh, to use a an awkward variation on a well-known phrase, it, it's older than the state of its parts. Okay. And as you can see in this photo here, an important corollary to the fact of Issei's regular 20-year cycle of renewal is that upon every rebuilding, because of the nature of the materials and construction of the buildings, the shrines begin to decay almost immediately. Okay. With the passage of even a few years, they begin to age in a manner that is quite visible, with the wood changing color, the roof made of thatch showing signs of rot, and the buildings in general acquiring a patina. What Issei underscores, uh, as much as perhaps any other architectural site in existence, is that architecture has a metabolism. Okay. It is deeply embedded in the natural processes of decay, of cycles of entropy and regeneration. It is somehow deeply uh, imbricated in the time of the world, the temporality of the world, in a way which is sometimes entirely at odds with the monumentality and perpetuity in which we typically think of architecture. Now, what we are calling here the metabolism of the shrine building is closely related to its design and materials. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, these now. Here uh, we have the main shrine of uh, the entire complex, the main shrine of the inner sanctuary at Issei. And um, all of the buildings at Issei follow the same uh, model and by and large use the same architectural vocabulary. So even though this is a shrine with 125 buildings, this is the main shrine is representative of the architectural qualities of the complex. As you can see, it's very simple in conception. It is um, a rectangular post and lintel building, uh, which is made up entirely of unpainted cypress. Okay. The wood is ornamented in some areas with gilt bronze fittings, and if you look closely at this photo, you'll see them on the railing. Uh, you'll also note the building has a, a thatched gable roof. Um, the entire structure is on a raised floor that rests on sturdy wood, wooden pillars that are planted directly into the earth. There is a balcony and balustrade surrounding the core of the building, and the building is rectangular, so it's three by two bays in proportion, a bay here simply indicating the distance between two pillars. And you can see that there are stairs that lead up to a pair of doors in the middle of the south-facing uh, side of the building, which is really the, the, the long side of the building, which is the front entrance. Now the wood used for the shrine is uh, cypress wood, the aforementioned Japanese hinoki cypress 
traditionally considered the best architectural wood in Japan because of its many agreeable qualities. Um, when Issei, uh, the, excuse me, when newly rebuilt, uh, the architecture at Issei shows off the qualities of Japanese cypress at its best with this beautiful um, kind of monochrome surface to the wood that practically gleams in the sun. It's very creamy and has these uh, wonderful hues and sheens to it. The wood that's chosen uh, has very few irregularities because it's very carefully selected. Um, and uh, carpenters of Issei's renewal will tell you that 400-year-old trees are really the best, uh, provide the best wood for this occasion. Now, what's important to remember about the wood at Issei is that um, wood in general is an extremely durable material. But in the case of Issei, uh, it decays because it is planted unprotected directly in the ground where the bacteria from the soil can eat away at the wood. So that is the part of the um, structure of the shrines that becomes compromised uh, over time and requires renewal. Now, the thatch of the roof is made of a river reed, a miscanthus reed known in Japanese as kaya, that is uh, specially cultivated and harvested for the purpose. It grows over two meters in length and is packed into bundles and placed over two layers of, of mats composed of thin bamboo tubes over wooden planks uh, to form the kind of uh, stratigraphy of the roof. And here I'm showing you a close-up which shows you all of the layers and the very thick bundle of thatch that constitutes the roof. Now, the reed decays fairly quickly and uh, by and large, um, after 20 years, it's fairly decrepit, although if it's maintained, it could have a life of up to 40 or 50 years. The origin of the form of the Issei shrines can be traced back to one of the most primitive types of wood construction in Japan, uh, the raised floor rice granary, of which you can see a reconstructed example here. And um, examining this prot prototype helps us understand a little bit more about the shrines. Uh, immediately, I think with this photo, you can grasp the similarities to Issei. This is a type of rice granary that follows a pattern of raised floor structure with gable roof that can be found all throughout subtropical Asia, especially in areas where rice is cultivated. And this is because of the extensive irrigation that rice cultivation requires with waterlogged fields. Uh, the raised floors allow for the contents inside the storehouse to be well ventilated with air and wind passing through underneath while keeping what's inside protected from mice, rodents, uh, creatures that might have an interest. Now, the reasons for the adoption of the rice granary as a prototype uh, for the shrines um, are fairly clear among historians. The rice granary uh, as a building that held the agricultural surplus for an agrarian community um, was a clearly a very important building. In prehistoric societies, whomever controlled the agricultural surplus was the de facto ruler of the community. Uh, but here I'd like to consider a little more closely the terms on we, which we understand Issei's own renewal. Because usually Issei's renewal is seen as a natural and inevitable outcome of the properties of the shrine's materials, its wood and its thatch. But this turns out to be slightly more complicated uh, than we might imagine. Uh, I've already mentioned that thatch can de decay fairly rapidly. But in fact, thatch is a common material used for farmhouses uh, still in Japan. And here I'm showing you a village of farmhouses in Japan's Gifu uh, prefecture. Um, Japanese farmhouses are typically known as ninka. And as you can see in this photo, um, they use a similar kind of reed for the roof in a kind of gable format. Um, but because these farmhouses are residential buildings that are inhabited, the inhabitants can do things to keep the reed in good condition, uh, thereby prolonging the life of the roof uh, by burning fires that smoke out and keep the reed dry, eliminating insects and mold in the process, keeping it clear of nesting creatures, and so forth. 
In other words, the inhabitation of a building, its engagement with human residents, can do a great deal to slow down the metabolism of architecture. And the fact that the shrines at Issei are uninhabited and untended once renewed is what leads their roofs to rot so much more quickly than those of farmhouses. But perhaps even more important than the, reed roo the thatched roofs uh, are, is the fact that the pillars in the Issei shrines, as I mentioned, are planted directly into the ground. The pillars themselves are made of the highest grade Japanese cypress, again, usually three to four hundred years old, and ordinarily such pieces of timber have a very long lifespan, and in other examples we know that they can, uh, uh, even used for architecture, they can have a life well over a thousand years. And there are hundreds of timber frame structures in Japan that are well over a millennium in age made of similar wood. But it's the fact that these pillars at Issei are planted in the ground, which means that the bacteria in the soil rapidly facilitates the decomposition of the wood below the ground, thereby compromising their structural integrity. And I'm showing you a photo here of a dismantling of a previous uh, generation of shrine buildings, which shows you how the wood, especially kind of on the inside portion of the wood that faces the interior of the building, is um, still kind of relatively pristine, but it's simply the areas of the pillars below ground that are being, uh, that are decomposing. What this suggests then is that it's not the materials themselves that necessarily dictate renewal or the rapid metabolism of the shrines, the rate of decay of the building. But at Issei, the entire architecture is purposefully um, engineered so that the decay is set up. You might say that the decomposition is, is staged to some extent. Now, why would they do this? Well, what's interesting to consider in this regard that, is that the Issei shrines were not the only kind of architecture being practiced in, J in 7th century Japan. Uh, during this period, and in fact, as early as a century earlier, there was already a new form of advanced uh, timber frame architecture that was coming into Japan from China and Korea. This was a form of architecture that was um, generally used for palaces and Buddhist temples in Japan and throughout East Asia. Uh, this new architecture has a familiar look, as you can see in this 8th century temple on the right. Um, it has a uh, there, it has a very a large curved tiled roof, um, which kind of dominates the visual profile of the building. And there were many aspects of the construction of this new mode of architecture, which um, preserved the uh, wooden frame of the building. The eaves of the roof, for example, extended well beyond the wall plane preserving the pillars underneath from weather and so forth. Uh, the timber was painted, usually, so that uh, was another aspect that helped to preserve it. But most importantly, the pillars stood on foundation stones, as you see in this image, which meant that they were preserved from the bacteria uh, in the ground, uh, in contrast to the pillars at Issei. Okay. Thus protected, the wooden components of such buildings could last a very long time. And ultimately, it might be better to think of this new advanced timber frame engineered architecture that was coming into Japan as not so much slowing down the metabolism of wood buildings, but as allowing the materials of the buildings, the wooden frame, frame of the architecture, to achieve a, a lifespan, a, a metabolism closer to its natural state, to achieve a lifespan closer to what would, it would achieve in nature itself. And by protecting the pillars, uh, the wood is um, allowed to enjoy a long life. So in this way, thinking through the material of wood really allows us to explore aspects of Japan's architectural culture that are rather unique. Uh, the way in which decay is purposefully sped up in the case of Shinto shrines, where the concept of renewal is very important to the religious principles of, of Shinto worship. 
But whereas uh, there are other types of wood buildings in Japan also where it's important to preserve as much as possible the original state of the building as you see in the case of Buddhist temples and uh, palace architecture. I'd like now to shift our attention to the genre of sculpture. Um, because along with architecture, uh, much of Japan's uh, legacy of religious statuary is also made of wood. And here you see a, uh, a Buddhist sculpture from the 8th century. This is a Buddhist icon, and by that I mean an object that is the focus of religious ritual. Uh, it dates to the 8th century, and um, it's going to serve as a frontispiece for our discussion of of sculpture. Uh, now, uh, I said that sculpture in Japan is made of wood, but as most commentators have noted, identifying the wood type of Japanese sculpture connoisseurly with the naked eye can be extremely difficult. Recently, however, based upon the microscopic analysis of the cell structures of over 750 uh, wood sculptures in Japan that predate the 13th century, uh, interesting patterns regarding the selection of wood type for sculpture began to be noticed. And this is uh, very interesting uh, for an art historian such as myself because it shows that the very selection of wood type uh, provides insights into the culture of Japan that couldn't otherwise be gleaned. Uh, for example, it was discovered that almost all examples of the very earliest sculpture made in wood in Japan, which date to the 7th century, it's the same century that witnessed the rise of the Issei Shrines, all of these sculptures were made of camphor wood uh, from the camphor tree, which you see here, known as kusunoki. And then, uh, for some reason, during the next century, there was a, excuse me, there was a switch to a different type of wood known as nutmeg or kaya in Japanese. Uh, then, actually, a few centuries later in the 10th century, sculptural produ production shifts again to the use of cypress, which is the same wood that we find in architecture. So, um, based on scientific analysis, we now know that early Japanese sculpture was originally made in camphor, then switched to nutmeg, and finally eventually settled on cypress. What does this all mean? Well, uh, let me just um, provide a bit of a, an interpretive uh, kind of assessment of this and begin with camphor. Um, camphor appears to have been closely linked to sacred or spiritual powers in early Japan. And some of the most erratic statues mentioned in the textual record belonging to some of the most prominent Buddhist temples are described as being made from pieces of camphor wood to which special powers were attributed. Uh, camphor is an unusual example of a deciduous evergreen whose ability to maintain its leaves throughout the year, like all evergreens, was a source of admiration, despite the fact that it was leafy and deciduous. And this lent itself to associations with longevity. It was also the fact that camphor was visually striking um, with its thick, knotty frame and complex structure, if issuing forth kind of myriad surging branches, which is kind of an ideal metaphor for vitality. Some of you may know uh, a very famous Japanese anime film known as My Neighbor Totoro, and this is one of the reasons that the protagonist, the, the Totoro deity of the, of the movie, is associated with this remarkable camphor tree that you see here. And associating uh, kind of supernatural qualities with the camphor was something that was deeply rooted in the early Japanese imagination. Um, it was also the case that it was very fragrant and there were, um, its aroma was closely linked to the camphor oil, which was desirable for ointments, medicines, and uh, foodstuffs. As a practical matter, it also served as a kind of insect repellent. So when the earliest uh, Buddhist sculpture in wood was made, uh, you might say that camphor would have been a natural choice. And in this regard, the shift in the following century to nutmeg uh, is also revealing. 
the emergence of the nutmeg tree uh, for sculptural wood appears to be related to a concept that was newly imported to Japan during the 8th century, that of uh, what I call the sandalwood ideal for Buddhist sculpture, the idea that Buddhist sculpture is best made in a wood known as sandalwood. Um, and that nutmeg would serve as something like a surrogate sandalwood. Let me just explain this idea a little bit further. Uh, in Buddhist scripture, Indian sandalwood was the material of choice for carved images of the Buddha and other figures in the Buddhist pantheon for centuries, centuries before uh, Buddhism arrives in Japan in uh, the sixth century of the Common Era. And as Buddhism spreads eastward throughout East Asia, this idea that sandalwood is the ideal material for Buddhist sculpture and Buddhist worship gives rise to a problem. And that is that sandalwood only grows in a very limited part of the world. It's really concentrated in South Asia. And uh, for sculpture to be properly made elsewhere, sandalwood would have to be imported from South Asia to various communities in East Asia where it is not found. So this absence of sandalwood creates the, generates the rationale for the use of other uh, preferably similar woods in the creation of Buddhist icons. And you begin to see this first in China, where Chinese Buddhist texts from the 7th and 8th century onward begin to make recommendations for alternative woods uh, based on the local environment, the local ecology. And the, importa the importation of this idea of surrogate sandalwood to Japan appears to have been the catalyst for the adoption of nutmeg for sculpture, because nutmeg seemed to have properties that were similar to sandalwood, a uh, kind of a purplish wood grain, uh, kind of a nice aroma, and it was deemed a suitable uh, proxy. Although I should say that sandalwood is very, um, small in radius, so it uh, only yields icons of a certain uh, set of dimensions, smallish dimensions, whereas net nutmeg is much larger. You can create much larger sculptures from them. But by the 10th century, sculptural production in Japan had shifted yet again, and this time to Cyprus. Again, uh, Hinoki, the same wood type uh, that was preferred in architectural production. And this, in turn, this shift um, seems to uh, be related in some way to changes in patterns of religious worship and patronage uh, that led the production of sculpture to um, expand its scale for newly conceived temple halls and monastic complexes. Uh, here I'm showing you a somewhat later example uh, from the 13th century of a temple in Kyoto in which one finds actually uh, over a thousand Buddhist sculptures of the Bodhisattva Kannon uh, aligned as the, um, as the object of worship. And it was this extremely um, voluminous kind of patronage of Buddhist statuary that must have driven sculptors to uh, select Cyprus as opposed to other kinds of wood for sculptural production. Um, a high volume of carved icons were demanded within condensed periods of time, and this really encouraged artisanal process in the direction of the prefabrication of parts for sculptures. Uh, sculpture, you might say, began to be carried out on par with architecture, on a kind of economy of scale on par with architecture, for which Cyprus proved to be the most suitable uh, wood. And so here, in this way, the kind of material profile of Japanese sculpture in each of these early historical eras, camphor in the 7th century, nutmeg in the 8th century, eventually the adoption of Cyprus in the 10th century, are really revealing of some cultural insights regarding the religious history, the nature of worship in early Japan that couldn't uh, otherwise be gleaned. Now, our time is growing short, so I wanted to conclude uh, today's webinar by now examining the case of Japanese woodblock prints. Single sheet woodblock prints, such as the image that you see here by the Japanese artist Hokusai, 
and this is a very famous image that you, you, you probably have seen somewhere before. It's known as the Great Wave, uh, dated to the early 1830s. Woodblock prints such as these are highly admired and considered representative of Japanese art as a whole. And they emerged in a much later historical era than uh, we've been discussing, uh, sometime during the mid to late 17th century. And woodblock prints in Japan would flourish uh, through the mid 19th century. What is little appreciated about Japanese prints is that they are created out of wood blocks, uh, such as the kind that you see here, in which the image is printed in relief on a block of wood. Uh, and typically, many such wood blocks are carved for a single picture. Uh, there is a wood block, for example, that is used to carve out the basic design in linear form in relief. Uh, which is used to print the basic information of a design, as you see in this example, a standing uh, beauty print in this case. And then additional blocks are uh, then carved, each one of which is used to add a color, a specific color to the basic design, uh, which means that a single print might consist of uh, anywhere from five to ten different blocks, a, uh, a key block with the linear design and color blocks. And it's this division of labor among blocks uh, that leads to the unique visual qualities of the prints, which are divided into, you might say, uh, linear, very strong linear and coloristic elements with pattern fields and so forth and which have this somewhat abstract quality as a picture. There's very little in the way of shading. It retains its outline. So um, it appears abstract. And this is what was appealing to many uh, Western artists when they first encountered Japanese prints in the 19th century. Now, as you could imagine, the quality of the carving in the case of Japanese prints is all important to the successful design of a print. Uh, the wood blocks were made out of cherry trees, which uh, cherry is a harder wood than that used for architecture. And the reason why uh, wood block technique was adopted for this art form is that it comes out of book illustration, where a word and image were oftentimes combined. Now, because of the flowing nature of Japanese script, Oftentimes, wood blocks on which all the components of an illustrated book, including word and image, flowing uh, Japanese script as well as accompanying illustrations, um, could be carved, proved more amenable than using a movable type, as in the West, where each, uh, co each kind of letter or character of the script had to be separately printed and then combined with separate blocks which bore the picture. Everything could be printed at once uh, on a page on a woodblock, and this was the principle upon which uh, Japanese woodblock prints would eventually develop. Now, um, I'm showing you here a, uh, an example of a book illustration in which you see both the flowing script and the picture on the same fold-out page. Now, in order to ensure precise cutting, the tools of the woodblock carver were all important. And these have an interesting history. By and large, these are the same tools that are used for all woodworking in Japan, including carpentry for architecture and sculptural carving. And yet, in this regard, uh, what's important to note is that there was a significant change in the 13th century or so when Japanese softwoods, such as cypress and uh, other kinds of uh, cedar, firs, and so forth, had be basically become depleted because they were so uh, relied upon for architectural and sculptural production. And uh, as a result, because of this uh, deforestation, carpenters in Japan began using more hardwoods for all kinds of woodworking. And among other things, this necess necessitated a change in the tools they were using. They needed higher quality cutting tools to accommodate the uh, Zelkova trees and oaks and other kinds of woods that they were using. And this led to a, a transfer 
of the technology of smithing from swords to tools in Japan. Now, as you may know, Japanese swords are famous for being uh, extremely light in the hand, but able to cut through almost anything. And this has a lot to do with how the swords are made. Uh, basically, they laminate high carbon steel over low carbon steel so that the outer edge of the, of the sword is extremely hard. Uh, but because of the low carbon steel in the core, um, it's very light and there's a lot of give to the sword in the hand. And this creates the kind of ideal cutting instrument uh, even when transferred to tool making. Uh, t Japanese cutting tools for prints and uh, for woodblock carving and statuary carving and architect architecture carpentry. Um, the tools are very, have very hard blades. Uh, they can make their way through harder woods, but they, they feel good in the hand. They really are calibrated to the micro kinesthetics of wrist and hand movement that's required for precise cutting. This really leads to quality cutting all around. And so there is really a close proximity between Japanese swords and Japanese tools, which enables the artistry, among other things, of Japanese prints. And so in this way, uh, you might say that uh, the um, wood is an extremely uh, interesting basis, uh, kind of window through which to think about and examine the arts of Japan. And I hope uh, by this point you have uh, some appreciation for Japanese arts relate to uh, the man-nature relationship in the Japanese islands and how they're directly conditioned by the biomass heritage of, of Japan's archipelago. Um, it's really uh, an interesting case study, I think, of the intersection of art with cultural history and also uh, with the environment. So that's the uh, end of the kind of uh, my presentation in the webinar. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Professor Lippitt, uh, thanks so much. What a fascinating talk. Uh, I am not an art historian myself or a, a scientist. Scientist, but um, I always like it when we can bring two disciplines that I think most people would assume are completely separate and smush them together and say, no, that actually they they do they are interrelated and they do feed off each other. Um, and so I found your talk just really fascinated or fascinating. Um, we have some time left, um, and I'd like to open this session up to uh, discussion and, and questions and answers. Uh, again, to ask a question, please type it in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. I'll be selecting questions, possibly out of order, in order to keep the conversation flowing. Um, I do expect that we'll be able to get to everyone's question. It's very rare that um, I have to cut the conversation off, so uh, please do ask away. Um, however, at the same time, I apologize if, for whatever time, uh, does not permit us to do so. Um, while people are typing in their questions, I'm going to invoke moderator's privilege by asking the first question. And I'm really curious, <clears throat> this shifts us in time uh, a little bit, but um, do you see any relationship between artists of the 20th and 21st century and uh, the natural world of Japan or, or possibly other materials that have been imported to Japan? Uh, yes, and is it okay if I if I speak in the microphone for my response? Yeah, okay. absolutely, please. Um, yes, you know, that's an interesting question, and I, I do think there's a way in which the sensibilities of artists that are trained and formed in Japan, even in the modern era, are somehow conditioned by um, their environment and the history of the close relationship between Japanese art and nature. And let me just give you two examples from architecture. Uh, one is the prevalence of... Um, concrete in Japanese architecture. Uh, concrete isn't a material that we would associate normally with artistic qualities, um, but its use can be very poetic in modern, um, uh, in the hands of modern Japanese architects. And the famous example of that is a figure named Padao Ando, who's built actually a number of concrete works in the, in the United States. And concrete is poured into wooden molds. 
and it's the master carpentry, the precision carpentry of the wooden molds that really generates the the fineness and qualities of the concrete that you see in the work of Ando and other architects. And that's an example of the transfer of traditional craft in Japan into modern materials and modern processes in the 20th and 21st centuries. And another example of this uh, is with a very recent uh, architect who's become very famous recently by the name of Shigeru Bang. He was awarded the Pritzker Prize last year, which is the kind of the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in architecture. And he developed something uh, known as paper architecture. He, he, he uses paper as actually a durable structural material in his architecture uh, by kind of, um, it's kind of compressed uh, kind of construction paper wrapped into tubes and laminated with glue, which he used as a structural force, much like wood in pre-modern Japan. And he claims that the durability of buildings has less to do with the materials and more to do with um, the knowledge an architect brings to the materials and the design itself. So he calls paper a form of evolved wood. And indeed, there are many advantages to wood, uh, but uh, excuse me, to the use of paper uh, in the way he does. And um, uh, it's recyclable, it's um, biodegradable, um, it is inexpensive. Uh, and he's recently had quite a lot of success using it in refugee architecture. Um, he works closely with UNESCO and starting with the Rwanda uh, refugee camps from 1994 where there was a genocide that you know led to kind of um, over a million displaced Rwandans. Uh, Shigeru Ban actually with a team of volunteers provided a remarkable number of, of shelters uh, using the, uh, his paper architecture designs. And so these are two examples that I would cite um, among many others uh, for the kind of continuity of this kind of um, relationship between Japanese art and nature that I was discussing earlier. That's also fascinating. That's exactly what I was getting at. Um, a number of people have asked uh, questions about uh, the renewal process at Issei Shrine. I'm going to get to those in just a second. Um, but while we're on the topic of uh, the, the, the modern era, Brian did ask, are current environmental issues impacting the supply of wood in Japan today? Yes, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating subject. And I had mentioned earlier that some 13,000 uh, trees are felled for the renewal of the shrines because it takes place on such a large scale. And um, Japanese forestry since pre-modern pre times has been very carefully managed to, to um, ensure that uh, the practices of kind of pre-modern building are sustainable. But invariably in the modern era, there's been a lot of pressure on on this kind of building. And despite the fact that the Issei shrines actually own their own cypress forests and um, um, have been very good stewards of their own forests, uh, in this, there is a sense that this is an unsustainable practice. And that was the theme of the most recent renewal in 2013. Uh, there were attempts to procure cypress from Taiwan and so forth, but uh, many, many commentators pointed out that this is kind of not really addressing the problem of a kind of a sustainable um, way of continuing the renewal. And so I think that they are, they are thinking about this. And one of the interesting things about that question is relates to the social meaning of the Issei shrines and architecture in general. Because the, I, would, I would say that the meaning of the shrines really lies in their renewal, in the process of building the shrines, as opposed to the final product itself. That the very process of building is, has meaning, has religious and cultural meaning. And what's also interesting about this is that every two decades when the Issei shrines are rebuilt, their meaning changes uh, in the sense that they are kind of a mirror of the times into which they are reborn. And if you take the post-war history of the shrines, uh, it's a good case in point. Uh, in 1953, the shrines were renewed after a four-year delay because of the devastation of World War II. And uh, 1953 was an important year. It was just after the American Occupation Army had left Japan 
and the renewal of the shrines was seen as a kind of renewal of Japan itself, as a kind of, uh, literally, a kind of a rise from the ashes, a renaissance of a war-torn country with hopes for a more prosperous, peaceful future. And that was very much, if you read press clippings of the time, how the renewal of the shrines was framed as a kind of a national rebirth. In 1973, however, when the shrines were renewed, this was right when, uh, some of you may know, there was a big kind of oil crisis, the OPEC oil crisis, where the kind of um, member nations of the oil producing OPEC uh, began purposefully limiting the supply of oil. And Japan, which is an island country with, with few resources, was almost completely dependent upon Middle Eastern oil. And so when, this, uh, when oil prices began to, to rise, um, this caused uh, incredible consternation, incredible stress on the economy. And if you read the kind of uh, the media commentary surrounding the Issei renewal from 1973, it's much more pessimistic. People are saying, uh, this is not sustainable, this will never continue, we shouldn't be rebuilding shrines, we should be, um, we should be fixing the economy. Uh, in 1993, Japan was experiencing a bubble. Uh, economy and it was much more prosperous and much more optimistic. So it was almost a complete reversal in the commentary around the shrines. And then finally in 2013, uh, again as a reflection of contemporary um, issues pressing on Japanese society, the, um, the, the, the press reception of, the, of Issei's renewal really focused on environmental concerns, how sustainable this practice is, and finding a kind of environmentally friendly way of continuing this practice into the future. So, so the Issei shrines are really a, a mirror of their times uh, upon every occasion of renewal. Um, on that subject of renewal, well, one sidebar, uh, Susan wanted to say thank you for clarifying this whole renewal at Issei thing. She said she saw a uh, an NHK documentary and it wasn't really uh, clear and this really um, cleared that all up. So she says thank you. Um, Lori and Constance are both wondering what happens to the material um, at, at Issei um, when, when uh, during that renewal process, what happens to the material from the old buildings? Is it recycled? Is it burned? Is it reused? What happens to it? Yeah, that's a crucial question. Um, most of the material is recycled if possible. And uh, I mentioned earlier that when the old uh, kind of incarnations of the buildings are dismantled for renewal, the wood is still going strong. I mean, the wood could last hundreds of years. And in fact, um, it's still kind of drying out over a very long, slow process and, and becoming better wood. Um, what happens with Issei is that the wood is usually given to other, um, other buildings, pre-modern buildings in Japan, shrines and so forth, that are in need of maintenance. And most uh, shrines will very happily welcome a piece of timber or two or maybe 10 or 12 from the Issei Shrine Renewal, and even Buddhist temples. Um, Buddhist temples endure. They have, their wood is protected, but occasionally they need a pillar replaced by a fresh piece of wood and so forth. And so it's actually, the Issei Shrines are so prestigious that um, it's considered a real privilege to be able to uh, uh, kind of renew their own parts with members of Issei. And, you know, it's a kind of a strange metaphor, but um, I sometimes think about these recycled Issei timber components as kind of uh, donor organs. They're really um, kind of disseminated all across Japan with every, with every renewal and kind of incorporated into the bodies of these other shrines and temples. And it's kind of a, I mean, in, in a certain way, it's a very moving uh, way of thinking about uh, architecture as these kind of living or organismic um, entities. Also, while we're on the subject of renewal, BJ wanted to know if the pigments for the prints, um, if there was any renewal process uh, or a, a metabolic process of that or a, a conception of a metabolism of the pigments. Yeah. yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question. And, and one of the things that um, I've learned over the years engaging with um, the culture and artistic production of Japan is that lots of organic materials are used and that uh, 
the paper, anything made of paper or silk or vegetal pigments, as with Japanese prints, does have a metabolism. Um, it starts with the paper, which, um, you know, fades over time. And the pigments are generally fugitive, uh, as opposed to oil pigments, which can last a very long time. These are vegetal pigments, dyes from, from plant stuffs, from flowers, and um, they can, uh, you know, they usually come from uh, day flowers or red comes from safflower and so forth, and they fade fairly quickly. Now, um, the, uh, what that means is that Japanese prints basically have the metabolism of ephemera. They originally, when they emerged in the 17th century, were, were not meant to last. They were used to illustrate kabuki plays. They were kind of playbills or advertisements for the theater um, or were closely related to the goings-on of that calendar year in the urban center of, of Edo, which is the, the, the capital of pre-modern Japan and would become Tokyo. So um, the, there was not much thought to um, ensuring that the pictures would have a life beyond their kind of immediate circumstances of appreciation. But what happens later on, and actually what is uh, manifest in this print that you see before you, the Great Wave by Hokusai, is the uh, introduction from abroad of chemical dyes. And these synthetic dyes, um, especially a dye known as Berlin Blue from, uh, you guessed it, Germany, is um, something that slows down the metabolism of prints because these synthetic dyes can last for a very long time. And what that does, among other things, is it turns prints from ephemera into kind of collectible objects because a, a um, consumer can get their hands on a print and know that it will be uh, just as vibrant. Its color, coloristic palette will be just as vibrant 20, 30 years um, from then. And it's a, it's a really fascinating way to understand the development of Japanese artists through the the palette and the materiality of the colors as well. And just while I have your attention, uh, I just want to say one, provide one small fact regarding Berlin Blue because the history of color is so fascinating. Uh, Berlin Blue is a chemical dye that's invented in the early 1700s uh, in Germany by a chemist who was trying to reproduce the color red, specifically the cochineal reds the very, very beautiful red dye stuff he saw on textiles coming from the New World, especially from Peru and that region, into Europe. And this was a color that was previously unwitnessed in Europe and was uh, a kind of brilliant crimson color that people were vying to, to recreate. And uh, in what happens in the laboratory is that instead of red, there's blue somehow that emerges at the bottom of the test tubes. And this is eventually what gets transported to uh, Japan and becomes associated with Hokusai and the rise of landscape prints of the kind that you see here. Uh, so uh, the history of color intersects with the history of art in a very interesting way and very much conditions the metabolism of art forms like Japanese prints. You could talk about transnational history, right? Um, we have three more questions I'd like to ask before we wrap up. Um, one of them, uh, Angie was wondering if we could go back to, let's see if I can find it, this slide, since we have a little bit of time. She was really wondering um, kind of if you could say quickly what's going on here and, and how it fits in. Yes, this is fascinating. Uh, what you see here is the cross section of a log that's being of timber that's being uh, used for architectural construction. And what you see on the diameter, the, the cross section of the log itself is all of the carpenter's markings for all of the pieces of timber that are going to be procured from this log. So there are going to be long planks um, that are going to be uh, derived from certain areas of the wood. And uh, the uh, relationship of the uh, different kinds of, of planks are procured from different areas of the cross section. Uh, if it's closer to the heartwood, the core of the of the log, um, you're going to get um, you're going to get a, a a different kind of wood with a different kind of grain. And so these are the markings that you see 
uh, by the carpenter here with a few measurements. Um, they're using something known as a carpenter square and a form of trigonometry really to, to determine this. And then what you see on the right are the, the wooden planks that are going to be used for, for Japanese architecture. And what's interesting here is that this is really predicated upon the idea of prefabricating parts in the studio, the carpenter studio. And then, uh, you know, multiple pillars, multiple transoms or horizontal tie beams of the same kind that are then taken on site and assembled, assembled fairly rapidly. And another thing that you notice from this picture that is fascinating is that Japanese joinery uh, does not use nails. Um, there are many different kinds of architecture that use wooden frames, but as, for example, in the northeast of the U.S., we, we generally find uh, nails used to fix the joins together, horizontal and vertical beams to tie them together. In Japan, there are, uh, carpentry develops in a way to create precision interlocking without the, the use of nails. And the reason be for that is that Japan is a seismically active country. There are lots of earthquakes. And um, if joinery does not use nails, it allows the joins a little bit of flexibility and mobility to absorb seismic shock coming up from the ground. Um, nails would fix the timber components together and just transfer the seismic shock to the rest of the building and cause its collapse. But because there are no nails here, uh, Japanese buildings can actually uh, successfully absorb seismic shock through their frames uh, in many cases, which is absolutely crucial for uh, land like uh, a place like Japan. So this is very um, precise, you know, this is not IKEA. This is precise uh, carpentry at a very high level um, that you see witnessed even in a picture like this. Even just that picture is really beautiful. and. Um you can you can almost see a building coming together that is just perfectly fit. It's really cool. Um, well, the next question, our penultimate question, is um, a question that's a, li a little bit on the side, but Colleen, who asked, is really hoping you have an answer. She herself is an artist, and she said that when she's used cherry wood to make uh, to, to, for carvings for woodblock uh, prints, she finds the wood to be really hard. She said at one point she was able to use a softer wood and she really enjoyed carving into it and the results of um, the print when she, you know, uh, she uh, was able to uh, apply it and the kind of the grain it gave. Um, and she doesn't know what it was and she was wondering if you had any idea you yourself, um, what, if you might know what it is, she'd really like to use it again. Well, sure. You know, if it's a, if it's a Japanese wood, um, generally um, for, so, for kind of precision carving, uh, things like cedar or cypress or a Japanese evergreen known as maki, M-A-K-I, are the absolute best and uh, really wonderful. You can really make your way with great control through uh, the 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 grain of the wood, the surface of the wood. Um, the reason why cherry is used for Japanese prints has to do with the fact that uh, when you carve a woodblock for print production, it is usually um, intended to produce around 200 prints or so. And what that means is you place a piece of paper, you, you ink the raised portions of the woodblock and you put a piece of paper over it. And then you, 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 you use a handheld press and you press the paper so that it presses into the raised design and absorbs the ink lying thereon. And so uh, any woodblock used to print 200 prints has to endure the heavy abrasion of 200 rubbings uh, of that kind. And a softer wood is eventually going to collapse the, the raised portions of the block are going to become abraded or actually just collapse under that pressure. So that's why uh, a harder wood like cherry wood is actually used. And so the, there was a cost benefit analysis there where cherry wood wasn't ideal for carving, but they had very good tools and they had to create blocks that would endure a, a relatively um, kind of uh, onerous uh, set of printings. But if you're making artisanal prints in which you are just using, um, if you're just creating a single artwork or, or using it kind of printing from it several times, then a softer wood like 
preferably cypress or cedar, but if not, a kind of a coniferous wood from North America, like like actually, I don't know, something like a fir, uh, fir wood would actually um, approximate the qualities of these Japanese conifers. Thanks so much. Um, our last question is from Brian again, and it's going to segue us into the final portion of the webinar, which is going to be on um, resources for further learning and, uh, and teaching. He wants to know if you have any recommendations in terms of books or literature or websites or something um, to help him learn more about uh, Shintoism. Well, yes. Um, you know, sh Shinto is a, is a fascinating subject, but it's, it has a long, complex uh, history, and I, I should say that um, there are some scholars that feel that um, uh, early Japanese religion is um, shouldn't even be referred to with the word Shinto. That it's really the worship of of kami, which are K A M I kami, which are uh, kind of indigenous deities in Japan, and that Shinto is a kind of formalized state religion that emerges later whereas earlier practice was much more informal. I, I actually like to retain the word Shinto just because um, if we get too, if we parse our, our, our word usage too much, we could kind of end up confusing rather than conveying knowledge. Um, but there's a recently a very, uh, very, very good uh, history of Shinto by a scholar named Helen Hardiker. Uh, H-A-R-D-A-C-R-E, Hardiker. It's just come out, and it's a, it's a beautifully written, um, very readable history of, of Shinto in Japan. And in the interest of, of full disclosure, she's a colleague of mine at, at uh, Harvard University, a scholar of Japanese religion. Um, but I, 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 I've learned so much from, from reading that book. And um, the only... Um, caveat is that it's a 700 page book so if you are feeling like you can't devote that much time to the study of Shinto uh, there is actually a shorter book which um, is also very effective it really I think captures a lot of the most fascinating aspects of indigenous Japanese uh, religious culture and it's called a new history of Shinto and um, it's written by two authors two two European authors and I'm sorry the uh, the name escapes me, but a, a new history of Shinto, which um, is is a is a is a very readable book, uh, around 150 uh, to 200 pages or so. But but again, um, either of those books I could uh, recommend without any reservation. Thanks so much. Um, well, we are going to wrap up in just a few minutes here. I do want to talk about some resources uh, that we have put together for you. Oh, there's my resources page. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> two things that we at Primary Source have put here um, together to help you learn and teach more about Japan. Um, this one you see here is our general resource guide on Japan. Um, you can see we have a variety of tabs. Uh, children, young adult books if you're teaching uh, younger students, films for yourself, films for your students, websites, curriculum uh, for different age levels, literature, medieval Japan, Japanese American internment, um, subsection of that is focusing, uh, of course, on Japanese in, in America, World War II, uh, and the atomic bomb, as well as the 2011 um, earthquake and tsunami, the triple disaster. Um, you can find a ton of resources here. I posted the URL for you at the bottom. The, we, the second resource we want to highlight is a resource, resource guide on teaching Japan. Um, and this one has uh, links to additional websites that you want to check out, including the Boston uh, Museum of Fine Arts, which has the largest collection of Japanese art outside Japan, um, and all of which I should add is digitized and online, which means you can um, use images from the museum in your classroom. Um, you can also see we have links to Boston Children's Museum's Japanese house exhibit. Um, as well as lots of other sites that feature materials on teaching Japanese culture effectively. Again, the URL for this resource guide, which is different from the last one, is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and on that note, uh, I think it's time for us to wrap up. Professor Lippitt, I want to thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, it's been such a pleasure putting this together with you. And I also want to thank everyone who joined us tonight, as well as um, the U.S. Japan Foundation. Uh, it, it's always exciting to work um, collaboratively with teachers, scholars, um, and other interested groups in, in helping students learn about the world. 
Um, just as an FYI, this webinar has been recorded. It will be up our YouTube channel um, very soon. Um, so feel free to share uh, with colleagues who weren't able to join us live tonight. And you can also stay connected to our latest programs and curricula, um, many of which, uh, like this one, are free through our website and our social media outlets that you see here. Uh, please check them out and everything else we have in store uh, for you. And uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone.